You're traveling through the unknown, a journey beyond the corners of reality, where the shadows whisper and the chill runs deep. Welcome to the dimension where your deepest fears are given form. This is the Midnight Mystery. When I first noticed that my boyfriend was talking to himself, I didn't think much of it. Even I do it sometimes. I think most people do. He would do it so quietly I can't even say for how long it had been going on. Maybe he had always done it. His lips moved rapidly, and his voice was barely a whisper, so for a while I thought he might be quietly humming. He would look down while doing it, while scrolling his phone or doing chores around the house. Maybe it was a compulsion, like a tick or even Tourette's, and I was trying to think of the kindest way to bring it up without it seeming like I was judging him. It all came to a head on Saturday. I was in the living room mindlessly scrolling on my phone while David was in the kitchen making us some food. Suddenly, he ran into the room and stopped at my feet with a wild look in his eye. Stop it! He did not scream, but his voice was raised, like he was disciplining an unruly child. I dropped my phone on my face because I wasn't expecting him to bark a command at me like that. What? What I'm not doing anything? I snapped back. I had no idea why he was reprimanding me for being on my phone. But his eyes weren't directed at me. He was looking directly behind me at something over my shoulder. I glanced back, but nothing was there. I kept looking between my boyfriend and the empty space behind me, trying to make sense of what was happening. He blinked rapidly and looked down at me. He seemed agitated. I'm sorry. He shook his head and rubbed his temples. I thought I saw something behind you. He answered slowly, still shaking his head. I sat up and snapped at him. And what was it? There's nothing there? You scared me running in here like that, I admonished him. He kept shaking his head and backed away into the kitchen. I went back to scrolling on my phone, but I kept shooting glances at David and back behind me. It had spooked me. For the rest of the morning, his whole mood seemed off. He was jumpy and he kept fidgeting with his hands, something he only does when he's upset. As noon rolled around, I suggested getting out of the apartment and getting lunch somewhere. David quickly agreed. Getting out of the house did us both good. It seemed to calm him down, and I was getting cabin fever being stuck inside for so long. Walking back to the apartment, we were holding hands, and I was leaning into him. So, are you okay? You seem so jumpy this morning. Do you think you saw a shadow or something? I asked, trying to keep everything light. He looked at me cautiously, as if he was weighing what he was about to say. I think you're right. I think I saw a shadow or something. Or maybe I was still dreaming. He smiled, but the smile did not reach his eyes. I decided to drop it. I honestly thought he was embarrassed. He had gotten scared over nothing and was worried about my reaction. That night I woke up to the sound of David talking. He was whispering, but the gentle drone of his voice had woken me up. I lay there listening. I had no intention of getting up or saying anything to him while I was still half awake. Once he stopped mumbling to himself, I would go back to sleep. During the day, I could never make out what he was saying, but tonight I could hear him clearly even though it was just above a whisper. I'm not going to do that to her, and you're not allowed to touch her either. You promised me. You promised me that this time would be different. His whispers were harsh and insistent. I almost said something. At this point, I thought he might not even be awake. Maybe he was talking in his sleep. That's when I heard a voice answering him. It was distinct and separate. My heart started pounding even as I tried to rationalize what I was hearing. This new voice, lower and softer than David's, wasn't like anything I had heard before. I couldn't make out the words, just the tone of it as it spoke. I couldn't tell if it was male or female, but it sounded angry. David shifted in the bed and reached over to touch my back. I didn't move, just lay there still pretending to be asleep. You're wrong. She's still sleeping. She can't hear anything we're saying. David rasped at the voice. The voice answered back. I still couldn't make out the words, but it sounded both insistent and scathing. Whatever. I'm done for tonight. I'm exhausted. You can talk to me tomorrow when I wake up. 
he hissed, and he lay back down beside me. All was silent in the bedroom. Minutes passed, and David's breathing slowed, and he started to lightly snore. He was asleep, but I couldn't join him. I felt my pounding heart just now settling down into a steady rhythm. I wanted to push myself off the bed and inspect the bedroom, but I didn't. I just lay there too afraid to get up and see what else might be in the room with us. Eventually I did fall asleep, though it was more like passing out than actual sleep. When my eyes opened, I saw the morning light streaming into the bedroom from the window. I pushed myself up into a sitting position and looked around the room. There was nothing strange in the room with me, just a pile of dirty laundry that was begging to be done. I rubbed my eyes, feeling a headache starting behind them. In the light of day, I could convince myself that I had just dreamed everything or hallucinated. Just then, David popped his head into the room and gave me a huge smile. You slept in super late. Are you just that tired? He asked, walking into the room and sitting down next to me. He had a cup of coffee in his hand and passed it to me. I took it gently and sipped. The warmth from the liquid was lifting my spirits. I didn't sleep well last late. I think I was having a nightmare, I explained, sipping at the coffee. David furrowed his brow and rubbed my back. Poor thing, you never have nightmares. Do you want to tell me what it was about? He asked, still rubbing my back. I shrugged and kept sipping my coffee, wondering if I should confront him about last night or play it off as some kind of waking nightmare. No, it's fading now. I can't even remember what it was about. I stood up as I spoke. I was getting hungry, and I hoped that David had saved me some breakfast. He hadn't, but that's just because he hadn't made anything yet. He had been waiting for me to wake up before he started on making something. I volunteered to make us some food, mostly because I was craving waffles and David sucks at making them. I started searching through the cabinets and fridge for what I needed. As I was busying myself with breakfast, I glanced up and saw David staring fixedly at the corner of the living room. His lips were moving rapidly, and I knew that he was talking to himself again. I looked away. It was too early for this. I was hungry, and I needed some more coffee in me before I could deal with any kind of crazy this morning. As soon as I poured out the flour and milk, David appeared beside me, causing me to jump a little. I snapped at him because he scared me. Jesus, David, you really gotta stop sneaking up on me like that, I hissed. I was already irritated from lack of sleep and now he had to startle me too. I'm sorry, he whispered, his eyes darting from me and back to the living room. But I thought we could go out to brunch instead. I shook my head. I already poured out the milk and flour. I don't want it to go to waste. He licked his lips before speaking again. Please, it'll be my treat. I just can't be in the apartment right now. He looked upset as he spoke to me. I set aside the poor, half-finished waffle mix and sighed. Okay, let's go out and get some brunch. I could use a cappuccino and a mimosa anyway. I agreed. David kept hovering over me as I got dressed as quickly as I could. I didn't have time to brush my teeth before he rushed me out the door. He practically shoved me out into the hallway. Usually, I'm all for a brunch date, but he was acting so erratic, and I was bouncing between being irritated and concerned. As we sat and ate our breakfast, I decided I needed to bring everything up. Something was worrying him, and the more I thought about the last night, the more this pit of worry was forming in my stomach. I think I just wanted him to tell me that everything was all right, that I had dreamed everything, and this was something normal I was blowing out of proportion. Last night I woke for a little while. I thought I heard you talking to someone. I tried to say it as nonchalantly as I could. David coughed on his eggs Benedict and gave me a horrified expression. What are you talking about? I wasn't talking to anyone last night. He looked at me wide-eyed. He was a terrible liar. Babe, it's okay. If you were dreaming, or if you have some kind of tick or Tourette's, it's okay. I'm not here judging you. I'm just telling you that I've noticed. And I think I was dreaming through part of it anyway, because I thought I heard something answering you back. I reached out trying to hold his hand, but he snatched it away. You had a nightmare last night. I wasn't talking last night. I was asleep the whole time. 
He was sweating as he spoke, and his eyes were darting around like he was looking for someone. I sighed and went back to my breakfast. David sat his fork down and was looking everywhere except for me, his breakfast forgotten. I hadn't meant for this to happen. Maybe talking about this in a public setting was too much for him. After we paid the bill, we were walking home when David grabbed my arm and forced me to face him. His eyes had a glassy and panicked look to them. I felt a stab of panic and placed my hand on his chest, feeling his heart pounding. Honey, are you okay? You look like you're getting sick. I moved my hand to his forehead, wanting to take his temperature when he pushed my hand away. I think I should go back to my apartment for today. I think I need to be alone for a while. He stammered, backing away from me. Okay, but if you're sick, if you come back with me, I can take care of you. I pleaded. He shook his head. No, I think I really just need to have some time to myself. He turned and walked away, leaving me staring after him on the sidewalk. Both our apartments were in walking distance, one of the perks of living in a city. He was always at my place so often we practically lived together. It felt unnatural going back home alone. I texted him throughout the day, but I got no answer. I tried calling, but it went to voicemail. Any irritation I felt for him was gone and replaced with pure concern. As the evening wore on, I was preparing to go over to his place to confront him when he finally called me back. David, are you okay? You haven't messaged me back all day, I was getting worried. I was getting ready to come over to your place. I said in a rush. No, don't come over here. It's not safe. He spoke in a low whisper. I almost couldn't hear him. What do you mean it's not safe? Safe for who? You or me? My voice rising in alarm. For you, he sputtered. Why? You're not threatening to hurt me, are you? Or is someone else threatening to hurt me? I was shouting over the phone. This was so out of character for him, I didn't know what to think. We need to break up, he hissed back at me. You need to stay away from me. You need to stay safe. He sounded like he was crying, and with that the call ended. I stared at my phone as disbelief. I know he did not just break up with me over the phone. I called back, then again and again, straight to voicemail. I sent text messages and messages on WhatsApp, but got no reply. I spent the rest of the evening crying, and only fell asleep after I took a sleeping pill just because I knew I needed the rest. Every message I sent to David was ignored. After a few days I stopped trying. I had gotten the message loud and clear, and I wasn't going to throw myself at someone who wanted to push me away. After a few more days had passed, I started gathering up all the things he had left at my apartment in a box to leave at his place. I cried while doing it. Breaking up was always hard, but I had thought our relationship was going well. Dropping off the box was harder than I had expected. I sent him a text letting him know his stuff was outside his door. At this point, I was certain I was blocked, but in case he wasn't, I wanted to give him a heads up. I lingered outside his door for several minutes. Part of me wanted to knock and see if he was home. Finally, I just turned and walked away. If he wanted to talk to me, he knew where I lived, and he had my number. Come to think of it, I still needed to get my apartment key back from him. That night, I was laying on my couch, half watching a movie while I scrolled through my phone. I was deleting all the pictures of me and David. Hello there, Amber. A soft voice purred from somewhere behind me. I gasped and leapt off the couch, clutching my phone to my chest. It sounded like someone was right beside my ear, but there was nothing. My eyes darted to the TV screen. Maybe I had heard it from there, but no one in the movie I was watching was named Amber. My heart was pounding as I tried to rationalize what I had heard. Immediately I thought of David, and his weird tick, and the voice I had heard that night. I ended up staying awake most of the night. I was scared. I didn't want to be. What I was feeling was irrational, but that didn't mean it wasn't happening. I got up to leave the apartment, but I ended up just sitting back down again. Where was I going to go? It was the middle of the night, and besides a few all-night diners, everything was closed. I didn't relish the thought of sitting on an uncomfortable bar stool. Sipping coffee, waiting till morning. Staying home seemed like the best option. I even thought about messaging David, 
but I stopped myself. He wasn't going to answer me anyway. I stay on that couch till the first rays of light started to peek through the blinds. I smiled. The sunshine calmed my nerves, and I felt myself finally relaxing and drifting off to an exhausted sleep. As I closed my eyes and curled into the warmth of the sofa, I felt a hand gently pressing onto my back, the hint of claws digging thought the fabric of my shirt. Don't go to sleep yet, Amber. We have so much to talk about. The voice whispered. I don't know, Chris. Eldritch abominations are kind of old hat at this point, my brother Terry had said, after reading over a rough draft of the latest story I was writing. His words stung more than I think he intended them to, because though I wouldn't admit it outright, I knew that they were true. Oh, come on, Terry. I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time I sit down to write. I had huffed back at him somewhat annoyed. True, but stories with big, creepy, indefinable entities are just so... overdone. Lovecraft cornered that market decades ago, and the internet is absolutely saturated with stories like that. Well, what kind of creatures do you think I should write about? What about vampires? I could not contain my disappointed sigh at that suggestion. Vampires are probably the most overdone monsters in the genre, and besides, they aren't actually scary because everyone knows their weaknesses. So, why does that matter? It matters because if the audience knows the monster's weakness, then they gain a sense of control over it, and any sense of fear evaporates. The essence of a good horror story is a lack of control, I said, sounding almost like a professor giving a lecture. Terry threw up his hands in an overly exaggerated expression of defeat. If you say so, maestro. I didn't want to come off as a conceited dickhead that couldn't take criticism, so I decided to concede that he did have a point. Look, they might be old hat, but they are easy to write about, and that works for me right now. I feel like I'm in a rut creatively. I just can't seem to think of anything to write about like I used to, and everything I do write just feels so bland and unoriginal. I end up hating it before I get halfway down the page, I said, sounding more fatigued than I had meant to. I pressed my head into my arms that lay folded on my writing desk, in my less than tidy room, in the two-story house Terry and I lived in with our parents and younger sister. Terry's expression said that he wanted to comfort me, but wasn't quite sure what to say. After a moment or so of uncomfortable silence, however, he did manage to think up some sincere-sounding words of encouragement. I think you're just being too much of a perfectionist, Chris. Like you said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you sit down to write. You just have to write what feels correct to you. Don't write to please an audience. Write to express yourself and remember what Mr. Talbot used to say. Terry's mention of the creative writing teacher we both shared in high school caused a wave of nostalgia to wash over me as I recalled the words that the gentle old man repeated to us at every opportunity, like it was his personal catchphrase. There are no original stories, only original ways to tell them. I mumbled aloud. Terry smiled in agreement as he got up from where he sat on my bed and made his way to my bedroom door, glancing back over his shoulder at me and saying, I'm gonna go make something to eat and I'll be back up in a bit, man. Take a break if you need to, and don't beat yourself up so much. The right idea will come to you in its own time. And you'll say to yourself, Eureka, I have something to write about now. With theatrical fervor before he walked out, leaving me alone with my thoughts and a rough draft of a story that now looked like a horrid and detestable abomination to my eyes, staring back at me from the screen of my laptop. I lamented my inability to reach into the ethereal realm of imagination just long enough to pull out the even the smallest embers of an idea that could in turn be nurtured into a fire from which I could forge words and sentences, and then use those to make paragraphs, and then build those paragraphs into a cohesive narrative that could be sold to a wide audience of readers that sought out even the smallest escape from banal, the realities of their day-to-day -day lives, with ravenous abandon and briefly considered deleting the whole thing in a fit of frustration before I just opened up another tab in my web browser and started monotonously clicking on YouTube video after YouTube video with the attention span of a squirrel stricken with ADHD. I had listened to about half a horror story narration, whose overall plot sounded infuriatingly similar to the one I had written when I felt my phone vibrating in my pocket. 
It was becoming relatively late at this point. The evening sun had just about completed its descent under the horizon, painting the evening sky with deep hues of red and purple as it went, and I could hear the soft patter of summer rain, like the subtle tapping of thousands of tiny little fingers against my window pane as I fished my phone out of my pocket to see who could be calling me. The number that flashed across my phone's screen was not one I recognized, so I just declined the call, as was my habit. I had barely put the phone back in my pocket when it started vibrating again. I took it back out and peered at the screen. The same number was calling me again. I declined it again, only to have it call me a third time. Whoever it was, they seemed pretty damn desperate to get a hold of me. So with my curiosity piqued, I decided to answer it. Hello? I got no immediate verbal response, but noted what sounded like running water and the steady, rhythmic clicking of something metallic in the background. I was half a second away from hanging up when a voice I didn't recognize finally spoke up. Hello? It said back to me. Who is this? Who is this? The voice repeated. You're the one who called, so you tell me. I had said, already annoyed with this mystery caller. The voice on the other end simply repeated my words back to me again in a sarcastic and juvenile tone, the likes of which you'd expect to hear from a middle schooler, self-assured and totally convinced that his lame joke was in fact hilarious. You're the one who called, so you tell me. The voice sounded like someone young trying to do an impression of someone much older, a gruff monotone that cracked at frequent intervals, revealing a softer and higher-pitched sounding voice that almost sounded feminine, though I couldn't quite decipher if it was male or female. But regardless, it seemed obvious to me at this point that this was some bored kid's idea of a prank call, and since I wasn't really doing much anyway, I decided to play along for a minute. I'm an unoriginal dipshit, I said, waiting for the voice to repeat it. The voice let out a delighted giggle before saying, you're an unoriginal dipshit. Yes, haha, very funny. Listen kid, 1997 called and it wants its lame prank call back. If you're gonna do shit like this, you need to at least be funny first. The voice didn't respond right away, and I was about to hang up when it said, If you say so, maestro. Then the line went dead. Weird. My first immediate thought was that Terry must have been the prank caller, and that he had probably used some kind of voice changer the likes of which you could buy at a Halloween shop or order online. I made a mental note to chastise him for interrupting my work next time I saw him, and then I put my phone back in my pocket and went back to surfing the web, putting the strange prank call out of my mind. I spent another hour or so watching videos and intermittently adding a few new sentences to my story that seemed doomed to remain forever unfinished due to my own lack of creativity before I decided to get up from my desk and go downstairs to make a pot of coffee, as I usually did when I needed to kickstart my imagination. Leaving my desk, I stepped over some dirty clothes that never managed to make their way to the hamper that laid at the foot of my bed and made my way out into the hallway. As I walked toward the stairs, I passed the washing machine and the dryer that lay in a closet just at the top of the stairs and noted the familiar sound of running water and the steady rhythmic clicking of something metallic coming from the dryer as the machines worked through their wash cycles. That was pretty common in my house especially since Terry rarely ever bothered to check his pockets for change before he put his clothes through the wash, and the end result was always that metallic clicking sound as the change left in his pocket was tossed around in the dryer. This kind of solidified my idea that Terry was my mystery caller, and I resolved to go downstairs and make fun of him for his lame attempt at a prank while I made my coffee. I strolled down the steps at a leisurely pace and proceeded into the somewhat cluttered living room where I found Terry lounging on the couch watching what looked like some old black-and-white noir film. The TV screen was filled with the image of a middle-aged man in an overcoat and a fedora that seemed to be the trademark of the genre as he browsed what appeared to be a library bookshelf absent-mindedly before a woman approached him and asked, Can I help you, sir? Oh yeah, I'm looking for a good mystery on something off the beaten track like the Maltese Falcon. He replied, the two characters bantered back and forth like that while Terry watched with intrigue, totally oblivious to my approach. I scooped the remote up off the couch 
and tossed it at him lightly, intending to startle him. He jolted upward when the remote made its impact and whirled around with a scowl on his face. What the fuck, dude? That's for that lame prank call. You seriously gotta up your game, man. Hard to believe you called me unoriginal. Terry looked both perplexed and genuinely confused by my statement, being ever the dramatic actor that he was. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb, Terry. The voice changer was a nice touch, but I could tell it was you on the phone. Nobody else calls me maestro. Phone? Voice changer? What the actual fuck are you talking about, man? Why would I call you for anything? You're literally in shouting distance. Yeah, sure of course, Terry. You're clearly innocent. It was obviously the boogeyman who interrupted my writing session with a lame-ass prank call from on top of the stairs, I replied sarcastically. Terry's response was defensive. Look, man, if somebody prank called you, it wasn't me. I don't even have my phone on me. It's in my room on the charger. I had expected him to smile and laugh while he admitted to making the call, maybe even make a few well-intentioned jabs at my writing like he usually did. But his adamant refusal to accept responsibility began to sow seeds of doubt in my mind. Cut the shit, man. I know it was you. It had to have been. I could hear the washer and dryer in the background. Terry opened his mouth to reply, but the words died on his lips as a loud crashing sound resonated from upstairs, and both of us turned a deathly pale. The sound was followed by loud scratching noises like nails on a chalkboard, and then the quick pitter-patter of what sounded like small feet running quickly down the hallway before silence prevailed throughout the house once again. I looked at Terry with undisguised fear in my eyes. Our sister was spending the night at a friend's house, and our parents were both working until late, meaning Terry and I were supposed to be alone in the house, so it goes without saying that we were both scared shitless by this development. After a few tense moments of silent stillness, I finally said to Terry, go get something from the kitchen. He nodded, understanding that by something, I meant a weapon we could use for self-defense since it seemed clear that we were dealing with some kind of break-in. Without a word in response, he went to the kitchen and I followed close behind. We each grabbed the largest and sharpest kitchen knives we could find and proceeded back into the living room toward the stairs. I don't think I've ever taken longer to climb up a flight of stairs in my life than I did in those moments. Adrenaline slowed the flow of time down to a trickle and each step felt like a mile. Even with Terry at my back, I don't think I'd ever been more scared in my life. As we both ascended the staircase, not knowing what the hell to expect, all of the typical sounds I usually associated with my house suddenly sounded alien and threatening. Every creak of a floorboard was an attacker about to ambush me, and every gust of wind that echoed from outside was a monster about to leap from the shadows. When we finally did make it to the top of the stairs, I found my bedroom door hanging open and after getting closer, I saw what looked like some kind of weird geometric symbol on the inside of the door that looked as if someone had carved it into the wood with their fingernails. Fresh crimson droplets of blood ran down the door in some areas where the symbol had been drawn, and I almost gagged when I saw what looked like an entire blackened fingernail lodged in the door, as if someone had jammed their fingers into the wood of the door so deep and with such haste that they literally tore off their own fingernails while drawing this weird arcane symbol that almost looked like a star with seven ugly points that curved outward along the width of my door, like talons with an inverted triangle at its center. What the fuck? I heard Terry say behind me as I slowly proceeded into my bedroom with the kitchen knife at the ready, since I was now totally convinced that some psychotic teenager had just broken into our house. As I passed through the door frame and into my room with Terry in tow, fear gave way to confusion as I looked around my bedroom expecting to find it ransacked after the commotion I heard from downstairs, only to find it neater than I had left it just moments ago, and not just neater, but wholly different in ways that shouldn't have been possible in the short time that I was downstairs. The wallpaper, for example, had been a dim, dingy green when I went downstairs to get coffee, but now was a bright mustard yellow with this tacky floral pattern. My writing desk and laptop were in the same place as they were before I left. But the laptop charger and even the outlet it was plugged into were now located on the opposite wall from where they were before I left. Clothes that had been strewn across the floor were now tidily folded, 
and placed atop an ornate-looking dresser I'd never seen before, and the posters of various cartoon characters that had been on my walls had been replaced with framed portraits of people I didn't recognize. An old woman, in an expensive-looking red satin dress with sad gray eyes, a middle-aged man in a dark overcoat with a bitter expression etched into his bearded face, and a yellow-eyed child, whose face reached into the uncanny valley and disturbed me deeply. He looked normal at a glance, but the longer I stood and looked at him, the more off he seemed. His eyes were too far apart, and his prominent cheekbones were a bit too high, while his nose was a bit too low on his face. It looked less like a portrait of a real person and more like some alien who had never actually seen a human child before, had attempted to paint one based on a description of one alone. Terry and I must have stood there staring at my room's sudden transformation with slack-jawed confusion and mounting terror for what felt like forever before the ring of the cell phone in my pocket snapped us out of our stupor. I fished the phone out of my pocket with trepidation and felt my blood curdle in my veins when I looked at the screen and saw my mystery caller's number flashing across it. I answered it almost without thinking. Can I help you, sir? The voice asked, sounding delighted that I had answered the phone on the first ring. What? What the fuck is going on? Who are you? What do you want? I'm looking for a good mystery off the beaten track like the Maltese Falcon. Look, kid, I don't know how you got in here or what you want, but you're sick and you need to leave my house now. My brother and I are armed, and if you don't get the fuck out right now, somebody is gonna get hurt. Somebody is gonna get hurt. You need to leave my house now. It repeated with a demented giggle, adding emphasis to the word my, as if to say that this was not my house at all, but rather, it's before the line went dead. My next immediate instinct was to call the police, and I readied myself to dial 911, only to have my heart sink as I found that I suddenly had no service. I turned back to Terry to see his face a pale, bloodless mask of dumbfounded confusion as he looked toward the doorway that led back into the hallway, and I followed his gaze to find that the plain white wall of our hallway had been replaced by the same mustard yellow wallpaper that now covered the walls of my room. Not only that, but on the wall directly opposite to my room, carved in the same grotesque manner as the symbol on my door, was a cryptic message of some kind that read, Seven points for seven doors, seven horns upon seven heads, and seven sacrifices asleep in their beds. What? What the actual fuck? Terry wondered aloud in a bewildered voice, and I had no words to form a reply. I could still hear the rain as it beat against the window pane from outside. Each drop against the glass sounded in my ears like the crack of thunder as my mind reeled from what was unfolding before me and the sound brought me back to what I know loosely refer to as reality. I clutched the kitchen knife in my hand while I turned back to Terry. We have to get outside. He nodded in agreement, and we both bolted for the hallway toward the stairs, only to find them completely missing when we made our way out of my bedroom. Replaced by a long hallway covered with that same ugly yellow wallpaper and lined with countless doors all etched with that same gruesome symbol and portraits identical to the ones in my room, hung from the walls at regular intervals. Scared doesn't begin to describe what I felt as I looked down that long hallway where my stairs used to be. Nothing seemed to make sense anymore. I looked behind me to see what remained of my house's second floor replaced by this hallway that seemed to stretch on endlessly until it faded from view. In a panic, I ran down the hallway as fast as I could heedless to Terry's cries for me to slow down as I searched desperately for an exit and found only more of the hallway. That's when my phone rang out again. I hesitated to answer for only a moment before I accepted the call and brought the phone back up to my ear. Hello? I asked. Hello? The voice said. What is this place? Why are you doing this? The voice's response was petulant like that of a child explaining the obvious. Because the essence of a good horror story is a lack of control. My response to this thing's twisted taunting died in my throat when I heard Terry scream somewhere far behind me, followed by the guttural growls of something that sounded utterly inhuman. Without thinking, I pocketed my phone and called out after him as I turned tail and ran back down the hallway looking for him. 
but found only a massive pool of blood that started in the middle of the hallway and ended at one of the doors on the right. I approached the door slowly with the kitchen knife still in hand, mortal terror making each step a Herculean task. The sharp hiss of the door's hinges made the hair on the back of my neck stand up as I stepped through the doorway, expecting to see something ghastly, only to see my empty bedroom. Just as I had left it before I had gone downstairs to harass Terry, I looked around in astonished bewilderment and saw that the strange hallway that had been there just a moment before I stepped through the doorway was now gone, replaced by my own second floor hallway. I must have slammed and opened it again at least ten times trying to get it to open back up into that awful yellow hallway to no avail. I ran all throughout the house, calling out for Terry, only to met with the silence of an empty house with my brother nowhere to be found. Left with no other options, I quickly donned my jacket and ran out the front door into the freezing rain toward the police station up the road, desperate to tell someone about what I had just gone through. I must have made it at least halfway down the street when I heard my phone ring again, for the last time that night, and I answered it with rage and indignation pouring from my voice. What have you done with Terry? At first there was no answer, just the steady sound of something metallic clicking in the background before the voice finally said, You have something to write about now, maestro. And the line went dead. You'd think that hearing that awful voice next to the unmistakable sounds of my own washer and dryer would have terrified me, because that meant that whatever that thing was, it was still in my house. But that's not what scared me the most about that final call. What scared me the most was that the voice now sounded exactly like Terry. Every night, no matter the weather, something walks down our street whistling softly. You can only hear it if you're in the living room or the kitchen when they walk by, and it always starts at exactly 3.03. The sound starts faint, somewhere near the beginning of the lane near the Carson place. We're towards the middle of the street, so the whistling moves past us before fading away in the direction of the cul-de-sac. When I was younger, my sister and I would sneak into the kitchen some nights to listen. Mom and Dad didn't like that, and we'd catch hell if they found us out there. But they were never too hard on us, since we always stuck to the one big rule. Don't try to look at whatever was whistling. My neighborhood is a funny place. I've lived here since I was six, and I love it. The houses are small but well-kept, good-sized yards, plenty of places to roam. There are a lot of other kids here my age. I turned 13 back in October. We grew up together and would always play four square in the cul-de-sac or roam around from back porch to back porch in the summer. This was a good place to grow up. I'm old enough to see it. And there's only the two strange things here the night whistling, and the good luck. The whistling never bothered me much. Like I said, I couldn't even hear it from my bedroom. But mom and dad don't like talking about it, so I've stopped asking questions. My dad is a strong guy, tall and calm. He has an accent since he moved to the US as a kid. His family, my grandparents, they're from the islands, that's what they call it. My dad, the only time he isn't so calm is if the whistler comes up. He talks a little quicker then, eyes move faster, and he tells us not to think about it so much, and to always remember the one rule, the big rule. Don't try to look outside when the whistler goes past. Not that we could look even if we wanted. See, there are shutters on the inside of every window, thick pieces of heavy canvas that pull down from the top and latch to the bottom of the window frame. Each latch even has a small lock, about the size of what you'd find on a diary. My dad locks those shutters every night before we all go to bed and keeps the key in his room. My mom, I don't know what she thinks about the whistling. I've seen her out in the living room before at 3.03 when the sound starts. I could see her if I cracked my door open just an inch to peek. She's not out there often, at least I haven't caught her much. But once or twice a month I think she sits out there on our big red couch just listening. The whistler has the same tune every night. It's cheerful. Da 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 dum. Da 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 dum. Remember how I said there are two odd things about where I live? Well, besides our night whistler, everyone in my neighborhood is really lucky. It's hard to explain, and Dad doesn't like us talking about this part much either. But good things just seem to happen to people around here a lot. 
Usually it's small things, winning a radio contest, or getting an unexpected promotion at work, or finding some arrowheads buried in the yard. You know, the authentic kind. The weather is pretty good, and there's no crime, and everybody's gardens bloom extra bright in the fall. A million little blessings, I've heard my mom say about living here. But the main reason we stay here, why we moved here in the first place, is my sister Nola. She was born very sick, something with her lungs. We couldn't even bring her home when she was born, only visit her in the hospital. She was so small, I remember, small even compared to the other babies. A machine had to breathe for her. We moved into our house here to be closer to the hospital. As soon as we moved here, Nola started getting better. The doctors couldn't figure it out. They chalked it up to whatever they were doing, but we all could tell they were confused. But my parents knew, even I knew, Nola getting better was just another of the million little blessings we got for living in our neighborhood. So that's why we stayed even after we found out that, for every small miracle that happens here every day, now and then, some bad things happen. But they only happen if you look for the whistler. See, our neighborhood has a welcoming committee. They show up with macaroni casserole and a gift basket and a manila folder whenever someone new moves in. They're very friendly. Four people showed up when we moved in seven years ago. The committee made small talk gave me a Snickers bar, and took turns holding Nola. It was her first week out of the hospital, so they were extra careful. Then the committee asked to speak to my parents in private, so I was sent to my room where I still managed to hear nearly every word. The welcoming committee told my parents about how nice the neighborhood was. Really exceptionally, hard to explain kind of nice. And then they told my parents about the even harder to explain whistling that happened every morning at 3.03 and ended at the tick of 305. The group, our new neighbors, warned my parents that the whistling was quiet, would never harm or hurt us, as long as we didn't look for what was making the sound. This part they stressed, and I pushed my ear into the door straining to hear them. People who went looking for the whistler had their luck change, sometimes tragically. A black cloud would hang over anyone that looked. Anything that could go wrong would. The manila envelope the committee brought over contained newspaper clippings, stories about car crashes and ruined lives, public deaths, and freak accidents. Not everyone dies, I heard the head of the committee tell my dad. But the life goes out of them. Even if they live, there's no light in them ever again, no presence. My mom, I could tell she wasn't taking it seriously. She kept asking if this was some prank they play on new neighbors. At one point, my mom got angry accused the committee of trying to scare us out of our new home, asked them if they were racist on account of my dad being from the islands. My dad calmed her down, told her he could tell our new neighbors were sincere and they were just trying to help us. He explained that he grew up hearing these kinds of stories from his mom, and that he knew there were strange things that walked among us. Some of those strange things were good, and some were bad, but most were just different. After the committee left, Dad went out to the hardware store, bought the canvas blinds, the latches, and the locks, and installed them on every window in the house after dinner. That first night in our new house, I crept out of my room at 3 a.m., only to find my dad awake sitting on the living room couch, holding my baby sister. My dad held up his finger in a shh motion, but patted the couch next to him. I sat and we waited. At exactly 3.03, we heard the whistling. Da 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 dum, da 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 dum. It came and it went just like our neighbors said. The whistling returns each night and we never look, and we enjoy our million little blessings every day. Nola breathes on her own and she's grown into a strong, clever girl. My dad even joined the welcoming committee. We don't get new neighbors often. Why would anyone want to leave? But when a new family moves in, my dad and the committee bring them macaroni casserole, a gift basket, and the manila folder. I can always tell by the look on my dad's face when he comes back if the family took the committee seriously or if we'd be getting new neighbors again very soon. Not long ago, a family moved in directly next to us. The previous owner, Miss Maddie, passed away at age 105. She'd lived a good, long life. Our new neighbors seemed like they'd fit in just fine. They believed the welcoming committee 
took my dad's advice about the locking shutters since they had a young child of their own. Whatever newspaper clippings were in that manila envelope, whatever evidence, my dad never let us see. But I imagine it must have been awfully convincing since our neighbors got along with no issues for the first month. One night, when our new neighbors had to leave town, they sent their son Holden to stay with us. He was 12, a year under me in school. I didn't know him well before that night, but as soon as his parents dropped him off after dinner, I could tell it was going to be a bad time. Do you know who is always out there whistling every night? Holden asked the moment the adults left the room. The three of us were sitting in the den, some Disney movie playing idly on the television. My sister and I exchanged a glance. We don't talk about that, I said. I think it's that weirdo that lives in the big yellow house on the corner, Holden said. Mr. Tolls? My sister asked. No way, he's really nice. Holden shrugged. Must be a psycho killer then. Nola tensed. We don't talk about it, I repeated. Let's go in my room and play Nintendo. We spent the next few hours playing games, eating popcorn, and then watching movies. A typical sleepover, but I could see Holden was getting antsy. After my parents had wished us a good night, locked the blinds and gone to bed, Holden stood up from his beanbag and walked over to where Nola and I were sitting on my bed. Have you ever even tried looking? He asked. It's nearly time. Like most sleepovers, we'd conveniently ignored any suggestion of a bedtime. I was shocked to see he was right. It was almost 3 a.m. I sighed. We don't... See, I can't. I can't even try to look because my dad locks the blinds every night and hides the key. He continued, ignoring me. So does our dad, said Nola. No, replied Holden. No, he doesn't. You saw him do it, I said a little sharper than I meant to sound. Holden grinned. Your dad locks the blinds, yeah, but he doesn't hide the key. He keeps it right on his normal keychain. So? I asked, worried I already knew what he would say next, because I had noticed that my dad didn't bother hiding the key anymore after all of these years, because he knew we took it seriously. So after your dad locked up but before your parents went to bed, I went to the bathroom, and on my way, I may have peeked into their room and I may have seen your dad's keychain on his nightstand, and I maybe went and borrowed the key to blinds. Nola and I stared, and his grin only grew wider. You're lying, I said. Holden shrugged. You can check if you want. Just open your parents' door and look. You'll see his keychain right there on the nightstand. Stay here, I told both of them. Don't move a muscle. I hurried over to my parents' room, but hesitated at the door. If Holden wasn't lying, my dad would be angry. Beyond angry. I was scared thinking about it, but more scared of an open window with the whistler right outside. I opened the door, barely an inch, and looked in, but it was too dark to see. Taking a deep breath, I walked into the room. Two steps into the dark, I froze. The whistling started, and I could hear it clearly, from my parents' room. I never realized, but they must have heard the sound every night since we moved into the house. They never told us. I don't think I could have slept through it. I stood there, listening to the whistling come closer, unsure whether I should turn on a light or call out for my dad. Soft sounds from the living room brought me back to reality. Nola! I yelled, running out of my parents' room. Holden and Nola were standing near the front door next to a window. Holden wasn't lying. I could see him fumbling with the lock on one of the blinds. I heard a click. He did have the key. Holden let out a quick laugh. Nola stood next to him, hunched up, afraid but maybe curious. The whistling was right outside our house now. I think I made a sound, called out. I can't remember. Time felt frozen, clock hands nailed to the face. But I found myself moving. I'm not fast. I've never been athletic. Somehow, though, I covered the space between myself and Nola in a moment. My eyes were locked on her, but I heard Holden pull the blind all the way down so it could release. I heard the snap of it start to raise, and I heard the whistling just on the other side of the window. But I had my arms around Nola, and I turned us so she was facing away from the window. 
At the same time, I jammed my eyes shut. The blind whipped open. The whistling stopped. I felt Nola shaking in my arms. Don't look, okay? I told her. Don't turn around. We were positioned so that she was facing back towards the hallway, and I was facing the window. My eyes were still closed. I felt her nod into my shoulder. I reached out with the arm not holding Nola and tried to touch Holden. My hand brushed against his arm. He was shaking worse than Nola. Holden? I asked. Silence. I reached past him and gingerly felt for the window, eyes still sealed shut. The glass was cold against my fingertips. Colder than it should have been for the time of year. I moved my hand up the window, searching for the string to the blind. The glass began to get warmer the further I reached, and there was a gentle hum feeding back into my fingertips. I tried not to think about what might be on the other side of the window. Finally, I touched the string and yanked the blinds shut. I opened my eyes. In the dim light leaking out from the kitchen, I could make out Holden, pale and small, staring at the now closed window. Holden? I asked again. He turned towards me and he screamed. Everything became a flurry of motion. Lights sparked to life in the hall, then the living room. My parents' footsteps thudded across the hardwood floor. I didn't turn to look back at them. My eyes were glued to Holden. He was pale, had bit his lips so hard there was a thin red line of blood running down his chin, and he'd wet himself. What happened? My dad asked from behind me. I managed to swivel away from Holden and look back. He looked. I'd never seen my dad scared before, but I saw it that night, in that moment. An old, ugly terror stitched on his face. A parent's fear. Just Holden? He mouthed to me. I nodded yes. My dad let out a breath. He looked so relieved I nearly expected him to cheer. But then he turned to Holden, and my dad's face changed. I wondered if he felt bad for feeling good that Holden was the only one that looked. There was a knock at the door. We all froze. Holden whimpered. Don't answer it, my mom said. She stood at the threshold of the hall. I'd always thought she was a skeptic and just humored my dad about the windows and the whistler. But that night, we were all believers. I noticed that both of my parents held baseball bats they must have taken from their bedroom. The knock came again, a little louder this time. Please don't open the door, Holden whispered. My dad walked over to him, hugged him close. We won't, my dad promised, still holding his bat. Nothing is coming in here tonight. Thud, thud, thud. This time the knocking was loud enough to rattle the door. Holden screamed again, and Nola clutched her arms around my neck. My mom came over and knelt down next to us, wrapping my sister and me close. Thud, thud, thud. Call the police, my mom whispered to my dad. The knocking instantly stopped. My dad looked over his shoulder at us. Do you think... He was cut off by frantic knocking that trailed off to a polite tap, tap, tap. Police, something said from the other side of the door. The voice from outside sounded exactly like my mom, like a parrot repeating the words back to her. Police, call, the police. Tap, 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 police. My mom pulled us closer. Police, 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 police. Please stop, I heard her whisper. I don't think calling them will help, my dad said. How will we know when they're the ones at the door? The knocking came back harder than before. The door shook, then it stopped. After a long moment, I heard the knocking again, but it was coming from our back door. We all turned together towards the back door, but the knocking immediately returned to the front door. Front to back, back to front, loud then quiet, then loud again. Suddenly the sound was coming from both doors at once, big, heavy blows like a sledgehammer. Then something started rapping against all of the windows in the house, then the walls. It was like we were living inside a drum with a dozen people trying to play at once, or we were a turtle and something was attempting to claw us out of our shell. Stop! Holden yelled. The knocking died. I won't tell, Holden said, staring at the door. 
I promise I won't tell anyone what I saw. Just please go away. We waited for nearly a minute. Then we heard it. A soft tap, tap, tap coming from the window Holden had looked through earlier. Holden started to cry, sobbing like a prisoner watching gallows being built outside their cell. My dad held him, brushed his hair but never lied to him, never told him things would be okay. The tapping at the window went on for the rest of the night. We huddled together in the living room for I don't know how long. Eventually my mom tried to take us kids into my room while my dad stayed to watch the door. But the second we moved into my bedroom, the knocking came back, so loud it was possible to ignore. I was afraid the door couldn't take it. We went back to the living room, and the knocking stopped. Only the tap, tap, tap on the window remained. None of us slept that night. The tapping stopped around 7 a.m. That's about the time the sun comes up here. We waited another two hours before my dad opened the blinds from one window. He made us all go back to my parents' bedroom first. I heard him open the door, then come back in. Okay, he told us. It's done. Holden's parents came back around lunchtime. My mom and dad walked Holden over to his house, and they all went inside for quite a while. Nola and I watched from the window. She stuck to me the whole day, right at my side, sometimes holding my hand. When my parents came back, they looked grim, but wouldn't tell us what they said to Holden's family. It was a Sunday, so we all spent the day together, ordered pizza, and watched movies. That night, everyone slept in my room, Nola and my mom in the bed with me, my dad in a chair he'd pulled over. There was no knocking that night, or any night since. We didn't see much of Holden or his parents for the rest of that week, but by Thursday, there was a moving truck in their driveway. Nola and I watched them packing up the whole afternoon after school. What sticks with me most is how tired Holden and his parents looked. All three had the same pallor, grim mouths and lightless eyes. Even from across the street, I could tell something was very wrong. Holden and his family were gone before sunset. I remember what the original welcoming committee said to my parents when we moved in. Not everyone who looks at the Whistler dies, but even those that live have the light go out of them, and the rest of their lives are full of misfortune. A million little tragedies. I think Holden's parents must have looked either to comfort him if they didn't believe or share the burden if they did. I watch Nola some days, happy and young and alive, and I wonder if I'd been slower, if she'd looked out the window that night. Would I have looked too, to comfort her, to share that burden? I'm glad I don't have to find out. We still live in that house, in that neighborhood. We still hear our whistler walking past every night. The blessings, the luck, the good things here are too good to leave, but we're careful. We don't have friends over to spend the night anymore. And my dad hides the key to the blinds very, very well. Not that I've gone looking. Some things you just don't need to look for. That's a wrap for today on The Midnight Mystery. Hope you guys had as much fun as we did. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. Oh, and don't be shy. Drop a comment below with your thoughts or any cool mystery ideas you want us to check out. Until next time, we'll see you in the next Midnight Mystery.